Retinitis pigmentosa is a very common uh, ocular disease, and it's something you could definitely be responsible for in the USMLE. Uh, so this is a complex set of heterogeneous congenital disorders that involve cell-mediated death of photoreceptors. So what are your photoreceptors? They are rods and cones. What do rods do? Rods are responsible for dim lit vision, for seeing corners and shadows and edges. Um, so if you're navigating in a dimly lit room, it's your rods that are doing most of the work. Whereas on the other hand, your cones are responsible for seeing details and colors. So in RP, rod death precedes cone death all the time. And because rod death precedes cone death, the first symptom a patient is going to have is not going to be, I can't read my book, I can't read the newspaper, I'm having blurry vision. It's going to be, I'm having difficulty seeing in dimly lit rooms because rods are responsible for helping you see in dimly lit rooms. They help you see the edges of the furniture so you don't stumble over it. And so the hallmark symptom of retinitis pigmentosa in its early stages is nyctalopia, and that's difficulty seeing in the dark, difficulty with nighttime vision. Now, I'm not talking about putting yourself in an interior room, shutting all the lights off, and you can't really see. I'm talking about dimly lit situations, so difficulty seeing in the evening time when you don't have the lights on. The onset of symptoms can be anywhere from infancy to middle adulthood, so that's a wide range, but typically the onset is in early adulthood, roughly ages 20 to 30 or earlier. So it's rather uncommon for this to come on much later than that. The incidence in the U.S. is 1 in 4,000, and about 1 in 100 people carry an allele that is recessive for a disease that will cause retinitis pigmentosa. So there are 40 isolated, at least 40 isolated genetic defects that lead to RP, and the natural history doesn't just vary based on the genetic defect that the patient has, it also varies based on the patient. So you could have five patients that all have the same genetic defect. You would think that they would all have the same natural history, but they don't. Some patients uh, develop it later, some patients develop it earlier. Some patients have a more aggressive RP, some patients have a more protracted and, and uh, less aggressive course. RP can be passed on through any type of genetic inheritance, and that makes sense because there are so many kinds of genetic defects that lead to RP. And in up to half of patients, the defect is de novo, or it's of unknown inheritance. Symptoms consistent with RP are seen in many congenital illnesses, and so it's going to be really important that uh, when you have your patient who is diagnosed with RP, that you look down their past medical history and see, do they have any other past medical issues? Do they have any renal issues? Do they have any hearing deficits? Do they have any neurologic issues, any cardiologic issues? because there are a lot of congenital sy syndromes that have retinitis pigmentosa as a feature. Okay, so just kind of looking at your uh, neurosensory retina here. So this, uh, the blue layer here, the ganglion cell layer, this is towards the inner part of the eye. So if you were to go in towards the eye and you stick your finger through your your, uh, through your lens and straight into your eye, this would be the first layer you would hit. So this is the inner layer. Uh, and this is the ganglion cell, but this is the last nerve that conduces to the optic nerve. So when you get a, uh, when your lens uh, puts on the, uh, the image onto your retina, it's actually displaying it up against your photoreceptors here, and the photoreceptors are what responds to the light and transmits the signal, but it transmits it this way, from right to left on your screen. So your image is actually going through all these nerve layers before it hits your, uh, the back of your retina and, and your uh, photoreceptors. So remember you've got your rods, 
and your cones. Uh, the cones, I think, are, uh, are just designated as purple here. And this will receive the, uh, the light, receive the image. Rods are very, very, very sensitive to light. Uh, a rod can actually respond to one photon of light, which is the least amount of light you could possibly have. So once they respond to the image, uh, they, uh, can do, uh, they conduce to the bipolar cells, which is just an intermediary layer uh, between the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells, which the ganglion cells send their axons to the optic nerve, and then that goes to the brain where it can then be processed. And there are other cells, uh, intermediate cells, amacrine cells, um, but that's not of importance for here. So typically, the patient with retinitis pigmentosa presents with nyctalopia, and uh, that's worsening difficulty seeing in the dark. So a lot of times they may describe this as uh, that it takes longer for them to adjust from the light into dark rooms. So for instance, if they go into a movie theater or if they turn the lights out at night, it takes longer than it has in the past for them, for their eyes to adjust. Other patients will describe uh, difficulty in uh, dimly lit rooms. They trip, they run into furniture, uh, and then as the disease furthers, as you start to lose your peripheral vision because of the loss in rods, you'll have loss in peripheral vision and that can get into uh, the way of playing sports, and some patients will describe it as tunnel vision. So the symptoms, the big three you need to remember, are nyctalopia, difficulty seeing at night, peripheral vision loss, which is tunnel vision, and photopsia, which is often described as uh, bright light flashes that the patient perceives. So as the rods start to die before the cones, the patient will usually maintain visual acuity even while the symptoms start to develop, and that's important. So this is not a disease early on, even in the middle stages of disease. This is not a disease of poor visual acuity. They're not going to come in, they're not going to present with 2200 vision. Uh, what they're going to present with is difficulty seeing at night and difficulty seeing uh, loss in their, their visual fields. Uh, but what they do see, they see acutely. For diagnosis, as you can probably imagine, you're going to want to do an ophthalmoscopic examination to visualize the fundus. And uh, this is the most useful test uh, in diagnosing RP in that the findings that you see through the ophthalmoscope are very characteristic. For a patient with RP, it's very difficult to confuse this with any other uh, ocular illness. But it is not actually the most accurate test. There's another test that's more accurate. Uh, of course, other tests may be useful in addition to diagnose a syndrome if a patient has other symptoms that are consistent with a syndrome that includes RP, and I'll give you a list of some of those. The characteristic findings on Ophthalmoscope include uh, mid-peripheral retinal hyperpigmentation, these brownish-black spots, and they tend to be in a bony spicule pattern. I'll show you what that looks like. Also, retinal arteriolar attenuation, optic nerve pallor, macular edema, and uh, as the disease progresses, bullseye maculopathy. That's a disease of the macula, and that's where the cones are. And this will signal cone death, and at this point, the patient will be blind. The most accurate test to diagnose uh, RP is an electroretinogram. Typically, this test will come after you've done the ophthalmoscopic examination and you suspect RP, and this will confirm your diagnosis. So your initial test should be ophthalmoscopic examination. Okay, so this is early RP. So you see a relatively healthy eye, except for up here. And this is pigmented dead layers. And this is very consistent with RP, if you put it together with the patient's history, difficulty seeing at night. So as the disease progresses, you'll start to uh, see more and more uh, of this pigmented 
area as well as uh, uh, blushed layers of uh, retina. Now you also notice that uh, the arteries are not quite as prominent as they were earlier on in the disease. That's the arterial or attenuation. Here's some more pictures. You get the idea. So this is what I meant by that bony spicule pattern. They kind of look like little spiders. It's kind of gross, but they do. So as you can see, this is a worsening and worsening and trying to go in that order. And as it gets as it as it worsens, it approaches the macula. Although the macula can show signs of death before uh, all of the eye is encased in this pigment. So uh, I wanted to find a picture here. One of these showed. Uh, Okay, so this one, I'm not sure if this is the target maculopathy or not, but that's what it's supposed to look like. This looks rather early on in RP, but if you see that target shape on the macula, that can uh, that might be a sign of, uh, of the uh, bullseye maculopathy. I don't know the patient, I don't know this patient, so it's hard for me to know if they're having any uh, acuity loss. This could be the beginning of the bullseye maculopathy as well. So you've got some depth in this layer here. Okay, so some syndromes that feature RP. Tertiary syphilis. This is a big one. If a patient that's older comes to you and they have RP, the very, very first test you should do after looking in their eyes is to get uh, a syphilis test. Uh, so the... Uh, VDRL test uh, because tertiary syphilis would almost certainly be the reason why a 50 or 60 year old would come to you with RP because RP typically presents earlier on. Okay, so this is a big one. Usher's syndrome is uh, probably one of the most common syndromic causes of RP. So Usher's syndrome is, uh, is retinitis pigmentosa associated with hearing loss and balance problems. And this comes from a defect in the inner ear. So they have both uh, the, uh, the ocular or the, um, the uh, auditory losses and they also have the vestibular uh, losses too. So that's Usher's syndrome. Wardenberg syndrome is a strange one. Uh, so this is RP, and they also have hearing loss, but they also have this abnormal pigmentation. Uh, and you see it in their hair, uh, where they'll have, the children will often have this white tuft of hair, uh, and then they'll also gray prematurely, usually in their 20s. And then vitiligo is possible as well, where they'll have patches of unpigmented skin. Heterochromia iridum, which is... Uh, uh, you have two eyes that are different colors, and then a broad nasal root, which usually you're not looking at the nasal root. Usually the way it looks is that the eyes are too far apart, but the reason for that is the nose is actually really wide. I'll show you some pictures with that. kern sarah syndrome is RP with uh, some ocular muscular disorders, uh, so they can have external ophthalmoplegia, lid ptosis, they also have a heart block, so you'll want to get an EKG if you suspect this. They can be short-statured, weak, and ataxic. bartet beetle syndrome is uh, RP with polydactyly, obesity, short stature, renal problems, dental crowding, and cognitive deficits. A-beta lipoproteinemia is RP with malabsorption and spinocerebellar degeneration, which will lead to ataxia. Neuronal ceroid lipofusionosis is RP with seizures and dementia. Refsum's disease is RP with anosmia, the inability to smell. Ichthyosis, which is uh, sort of the scaling up of the skin. Hearing loss, ataxia, arrhythmia, and peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so probably the best one to remember here is the tertiary syphilis. This can cause RP. Uh, another one that's good to know is the phenothiazine thyridazine association. We don't 
tend to give these drugs out that as much as we used to, but the ones that we do are uh, one of the phenothiazines, and uh, that's prochlorperazine, and it's given for uh, as an anti-emetic. Uh, so that can be a side effect of, uh, of compazine, and uh, that's worth knowing. So also good to know your patient's med list, too. It's rare, but it's possible. So this is Wardenberg syndrome. See that white tuft of hair? That's not dyed. That's totally natural. And it's in this baby, too. And you can see, actually, if you look into this baby's eyes, you can see that the baby's eyes are kind of brown and kind of blue here, and also spots of brown and blue. So they have different colored eyes. And this little girl also uh, looks like she's got some brown spots in her eyes, too. So that's the heterochromia iridum. And, uh, and then if you look at the nasal root, the nasal root is actually really wide here. And it looks like the eyes are far apart, which they are, but it's because of the nasal root. Okay. Uh, Bardet beetle syndrome, this is the one where they can have polydactyly. Not sure if that's in this patient or if they have the... Uh, extra digit removed. Uh, they can also have uh, dental crowding, uh, a high arched palate. Uh, they tend to appear obese uh, and they also uh, appear short too. And then this is the uh, this is the RP. So for diagnosis, as I mentioned, the most accurate test in diagnosis is an electroretinogram. That'll show marked reduction both in cone and rod signals, but your rod loss will be more severe because those die first. The therapies, unfortunately, are limited, but they do exist. The best therapy uh, that uh, we have so far as far as medical therapy is lutein. That's usually taken 20 milligrams every day. All patients with RP should be seen at least annually by an ophthalmologist, and they should be tested at least every five years uh, with electroretinogram to, to uh, chart their course. Occupational therapy, of course, is going to be useful for these patients since they will have a disability that is uh, decreased vision, ultimately blindness. Other possibly useful routes that have shown some efficacy in the literature, um, but certainly not... Uh, FDA approved by any means, uh, would be supplemental vitamin A, uh, DHA, acetazolamide, valproic acid, and a diet rich in omega-3s and leafy greens. Uh, there's something new that's come out in the last couple years, and that's a retinal implant, the Argus II retinal prosthesis syndrome, uh, system, and this is for patients with advanced RP. But what this is, is it's a, they wear these like sunglasses, sort of, and there's a video camera on the front and it transmits the picture, what the video camera sees, into signals similar to how your photoreceptors would process it, and it goes back into the optic nerve. So it's essentially mimicking your photoreceptors and doing what they should be doing. So this is the new thing uh, out there to help people with not just RP, but other similar retinal diseases as well. So as far as uh, what's the most important thing to know, uh, remember the presenting symptoms, the nyctalopia, uh, and remember what uh, it looks like through the ophthalmoscope when you have a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. Pretty easy to remember. You got a lot of pigment in the eye with retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and uh, make them known below. See you next time.